1661. A coffin was ripped out of the ground. The rotting remains of Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, were strung up at Tyburn like a common criminal. Cromwell rose from Fenland farmer to become the most powerful commoner in British history. But he got there by very un-British means, revolution. His passionate convictions led to the killing of a king, swept away almost 1,000 years of monarchy and gave Britain its only experience of republican rule. In all this, Cromwell believed he was led by the will of God. But there's more to Oliver Cromwell than the grim-faced Puritan of legend. The real Cromwell's fiery. His emotions seesaw. You are whoremasters and drunkards. He was prone to manic depression. He loves really childish practical jokes. He's such a paradoxical figure. About 50% saint and 50% serpent. In 1628, Oliver Cromwell was 29. Convinced he was dying, he travelled from his Huntingdon home to visit a leading London doctor. What is pretty clear about Cromwell's mental condition at the opening of the 1630s is that he's having a nervous breakdown. He's in what's very clearly acute clinical depression, melancholia, and he stays down. He's a broken man. Cromwell went to see one of the great physicians of the day uh, who couldn't diagnose anything more than general depression. Regrettably, he couldn't offer him Prozac or uh, any quick solution to this. Probably sent him back to the fens, uh, the dour landscape. Cromwell had plenty to be depressed about. He was the poor relation in a family of wealthy East Anglian landowners. His father died when he was 18, leaving him with only a few acres of land to support his widowed mother, his wife Elizabeth, their five young children and six unmarried sisters. And Cromwell did not make life easy for himself. He's a man of rages, he's a man of great loves, of great flights of violence. They are the sign of somebody who's not quite in control of himself. Cromwell was a councillor in his hometown of Huntingdon. At one meeting, he lost his temper and turned a minor disagreement about parish affairs into a major row. Cromwell ended up insulting the mayor and was thrown off the council in disgrace. He has to issue a public apology at a town a council meeting in front of everybody. I mean, you can imagine a small place like this. This is a great uh, humiliation, a public humiliation. That's the point of it. The shame was so great, Cromwell had to leave Huntingdon altogether. He sold his father's land and moved his family to the nearby small town of St. Ives. He sold his property probably for about... 1800 pounds which wasn't a vast amount and he was actually renting the farm in St. Ives so he's almost he's beginning to slip out of the ranks of the gentry as head of the family Cromwell also had to find the cash to pay for dowries for his six sisters their marriage prospects how high up in the social order they can go depend entirely upon the size of their dowry and for the Cromwell girls each of them is moving down in the social order. It's possible he was now working the land with his own hands. He was doing rough uh, physical labor. All of this together leads to a kind of physical and psychological uh, crisis uh, in his life. For Cromwell, there could be just one explanation for these tribulations. You have to remember that the majority of people believed that God actually ran the world on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if Cromwell suffers this blow in Huntingdon, then there must be a reason for it. God must be humbling him for some reason. 
Cromwell was terrified that his soul was destined for eternal damnation. The snares of death compassed me round about, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I shall find trouble and heaviness, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Then, at his lowest ebb, Cromwell realized he had been saved. The Lord forsaketh me not. Blessed be his name for shining upon so dark a heart as mine. You know what my manner of life hath been. Oh, I have lived in and loved darkness and hated the light. I was a chief, the chief of sinners. I hated godliness, yet God had a mercy on me. Oh, the riches of his mercy. Something happens uh, that makes him certain that he is saved, and it changes him entirely. He's only saved because he's given therapy, uh, not by a, a conventional shrink, but by the next best thing for the age, who's a hellfire Puritan preacher called Joe Tookie, who ministers in the local town. You must know when a man goes through life without any troubles, then his experience is of no purpose. Tookie gives Cromwell the best possible therapy by convincing him that God thinks he's special. He's trashed Cromwell in order to raise him up again for a great purpose. And this actually makes Cromwell's disgrace seem like a privilege from God, brings him out of his depression, makes him feel worthwhile, privileged, special, instead of being worthless. And literally, he's born again. When God's presence is taken away, there is nothing but horror and trembling, and I have known such, when his presence has been taken away, have had their souls so pressed with horror that they have said that if all creatures in hell were to torment them, it would be as nothing compared to the withdrawing of God's presence. Cromwell emerged from this spiritual awakening as a member of England's most fervent religious group, the Puritans. In a Protestant England, the Puritans were the most rigorous Protestants of all, and East Anglia was their heartland. For if we live in any known sin, we are dead. Cromwell was drawn to the Puritans' personal relationship with God, their rigorous study of the Bible, and their constant soul-searching. When a man lives in lust... In this disciplined life, Cromwell found the security he craved. From now on, he'd feel the cheerful certainty of his direct relationship with God. You have this idea that has come down through the years that it's puritanical and it's dreadfully dour. But all of these people who believed that they were going to be saved uh, were very, very inwardly happy. They were all blissful in the knowledge that what they were doing was correct. They were the chosen ones. If Cromwell needed proof that God was watching over him, it came in 1636. A childless uncle died, leaving him a house and extensive lands in the cathedral city of Ely. At a stroke, Cromwell was once more a gentleman. Cromwell's flagging fortunes are now revived in a spectacular way. Cromwell would have seen this inheritance as God's watching over him, of God's deliberate intervention into his a life and a sign that the uh, travails that he had experienced in Huntington and in St. Ives were over. In Ely, Cromwell settled down to a life of peace and prosperity. But elsewhere, a storm was brewing that would blast him out of obscurity. England was gripped by religious conflict. The state was persecuting Puritans, burning their books and imprisoning their clergymen. Behind this crackdown was the king, Charles I. For Charles, the Church of England was the source of his power. A hierarchy of bishops and priests guided the minds and morals of his people. But the Puritans ignored this hierarchy and dealt directly with God. In doing so, the authority of the church was subverted and the power of the king was undermined. Charles is not a man for compromise or flexibility. He 
feels that the government is to be obeyed. He has a clear idea. He makes up his mind uh, what his religious policy is, what his political policy, and he demands obedience to it. For Charles, religious imagery and sacred ritual brought his subjects closer to God. But for Puritans like Cromwell, this was idolatry, a distraction from the true religion. People's souls were at stake. Puritans thought that if you believed the wrong things, you went to hell. And if you worshipped in the wrong way, this would take you away from God. It would take you towards the devil. Charles's version of Christianity looked neither Protestant nor English. Instead, it seemed both Catholic and continental. Charles's French wife was a practicing Catholic, and Catholics dominated his court. There is a great war going on on the continent, a struggle between Catholicism and Protestantism flat out for supremacy in Europe. And during the late 20s, the Protestants are doing very badly. And there is this sense of terror about Catholic plots and everything that happens from fires uh, in London to, to lightning bolts hitting churches. All of this is blamed directly on Catholic uh, schemes. King Charles had dismissed Parliament, which he saw as a hotbed of Puritan troublemakers, in 1629. And for the next 11 years, he ruled alone. But when he tried to impose taxes without parliamentary approval, many of his subjects refused to pay. Finally, in 1640, facing a political crisis in Scotland and desperately short of money, Charles was forced to recall Parliament. The scene was set for a showdown. Among the MPs who travelled to Westminster that fateful year was the new member for Cambridge, a 40-year-old Puritan farmer called Oliver Cromwell. Gentlemen, gentlemen, it was for good reason that God raised man above... Gentlemen, it was for good reason that God raised man alone above all the beasts in Eden. On his first day in Parliament, Cromwell turned up with blood on his collar. An observer noted he was a man who cared little about his appearance. I perceived a gentleman very ordinary apparelled. He wore a plain cloth made by an ill country tailor. His linen was not very clean. His countenance was swollen and reddish, his voice sharp and untunable, his eloquence full of fervour. Cromwell was a man on a mission. He threw himself into parliamentary politics with the same fervor he had shown as a Huntingdon councillor. We begin to see him on committees for religion. These are the politically powerful committees, and it's quite clear that he achieves this by frequent participation and a zeal that's recognized by other zealous people. But he's by no means an accomplished parliamentarian. In fact, he's something of a bull in the china shop, trying to move things too quickly, not understanding the subtleties of policy and speaking his heart uh, rather than his mind. The atmosphere in Parliament was tense. Cromwell was related to no less than nine other MPs, part of a Puritan network that was spoiling for a fight. They demanded limitations on the king's power exactly what Charles had been dreading. Kings ruled by divine right. They were answerable to God, not to their subjects, not to Parliament. The job of Parliament was to give advice, to uh, help the king to pass laws, and above all, to give money, and then to go home again. But this Parliament had no intention of going home. Within a year, they'd wrung significant concessions from Charles. Moderate MPs urged compromise. But in October, any hope of a settlement was blown away by the arrival of catastrophic news from Ireland. Irish Catholics had rebelled, massacring Protestant settlers. The rebels thrust their pitchforks into children's bellies and threw them into the water. Wildly exaggerated rumours of atrocities spread throughout the land. The two eldest children are roasted upon spits before their parents' faces. 
The rebellion had to be crushed, and that meant raising an army. But in a deeply divided country, the question was, whose army would it be? Everyone agrees, the king agrees as well, uh, that there has to be an army raised uh, to suppress the Irish rebellion. And then the question is, who's to command it? Now, the military power in this society is wholly the king's. There is no military power vested uh, in Parliament. But Parliament can't possibly imagine trusting the king with an army. He won't take it to Ireland. He'll use it against us. So Parliament has to preempt that. It has to raise its own army. It's at that point, really, that Parliament is in effect making a claim for sovereignty. Not a legal claim. It doesn't put it like that. But if Parliament controls the army, what doesn't it control? When he heard Parliament plan to raise an army, Charles exploded in a rage. This was rebellion. The king set about raising his own force from the nobility and gentry who remained loyal to him. Puritans like Cromwell faced a stark choice between their god and their king. These people had been raised up uh, and it was a very, very heavy responsibility. You couldn't let God down. I mean, that was the greatest sin of all. And if he demanded extraordinary things of you, uh, sacrifices from you, risks from you, courage from you, you must give them. Before a force like that, principalities and powers can go down, and they do. A religious dispute had brought England to the brink of war. In the next decade, the world would be turned upside down. And onto this chaotic, bloody stage would step Oliver Cromwell. The 2nd of July, 1644. Marston Moor, just outside York. Parliamentary soldiers prayed for victory over the royalist enemy. For two years, Englishmen had fought Englishmen with neither side gaining the advantage. Today, that deadlock would be broken in one of the bloodiest ever battles on English soil. Commanding 4,000 cavalry was a 45-year-old colonel called Oliver Cromwell. When the Civil War began, he'd been a politician with no military experience, but once in battle, Cromwell had discovered a remarkable talent for warfare. It's that active side of his character. Uh, I suspect he was much happier uh, raising uh, troops and riding into the towns and finding volunteers and explaining what the issues were uh, than he was trying to negotiate the complexities of parliamentary committees and holding his tongue and being shushed in Parliament. Cromwell had risen quickly from captain to colonel. He'd recruited men from his native East Anglia and trained them himself. They were already known as Ironsides. Cromwell's relationship with his men is the key to his success. There's absolutely no question about that. He had three simple rules. Discipline, discipline, discipline. Early on in the war, uh, a newspaper reported that Cromwell's lovely company as he called it, were highly disciplined. Nobody could swear, nobody could call the other one names. And anyone who did, they were punished. And it was reported in that newspaper that it would be much better for Parliament if everybody had a regiment like Cromwell's. So even from day one, he could read men, he could understand men, and he knew that if he developed a relationship with them, that that would be the key. Cromwell's criteria for choosing his recruits were simple. Were they godly men, and did they know what they were fighting for? Nothing else mattered, not even their social origins. Fellow commanders found this a radical, even dangerous idea. Colonel Cromwell, raising his regiment, makes choice of his officers not such as were soldiers or men of his state, but such as were common men, poor and of mean parentage. Cromwell fiercely defended his men. I'd rather have a russet-coated captain that knows what he fights for than what you call a gentleman and is nothing else. It may be it provokes some spirits to see such plain men made captains of horse. It had been well that men of honour and birth had entered these employments, but why do they not appear? Who would have hindered them? But since that it was necessary for the work to go on, 
better plain men than none. He had a respect for a certain kind of equality, not social or economic equality, but spiritual equality. And so there is this sense that ordinary men had a contribution to make, ordinary men were capable of good things. And I think that sense of equality also shows in the way that he organised his regiment. Cromwell was no Democrat. For him, what counted was equality in the eyes of God. As he prepared for this decisive battle, Colonel Cromwell knew his men had never faced such formidable odds. At Marston Moor, he confronted the most feared general in the Royalist army, Charles's nephew, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Only 23, his devastating cavalry charges were already famous across Europe. He epitomized the dashing cavalier, riding into battle with his lucky charm, a pet poodle called Boy. You have two very different men. You have a parliamentarian cavalry commander in Cromwell, who comes from a minor gentry family, who has not made yet a mark for himself as a military commander and on the other hand you have the king's nephew a man naturally given leadership in a society where social status and military leadership still equate who has throughout the civil war invariably won victories and attracted a certain legend in his own lifetime on the day of Marston Moor. You could not have two more unlikely associates on a field of battle. All day, the two armies faced each other. Then in the late afternoon, as Rupert was having dinner, the parliamentarians charged. Cromwell and his cavalry smashed into the Royalist right flank. Cromwell in battle is Cromwell at his best. He's incredibly brave, like a true cavalry captain and then general. He leads charges from the front himself. At Marston Moor, he's chopped across the neck by an enemy sabre. Had the blade been about half an inch deeper, then Cromwell would have lost an artery or a vein. That would have been the end of him. He's knocked to the ground and picked up again. His wound's dressed. He gets back on his horse and leads another charge. Cromwell took advantage of his enemy's greatest weakness. One of the great problems with the cavalry of Prince Rupert is that they're very dashing and they sort of crash through the lines very, very effectively, but very quickly they almost disappear off the battlefield as they go in search of, of booty. Cromwell makes sure that doesn't happen. Defying conventional military wisdom, Cromwell led his disciplined cavalrymen in a second surprise charge. He keeps his cavalry firmly grouped and under control so he can begin to move around the battlefield in the wake of the retreating enemy and bring the full force of his cavalry to bear a second time. The look of such ferocity came on his face. People actually said that they were scared to look at him uh, when he was in the heat uh, of battle. But his greatest characteristic uh, in battle, and one that is so rare, is his ability to keep his head during the fighting. And that's incredibly hard to do, get people to discipline themselves and the terror of it, to discipline the horses who are terrifying with all the smoke and the gunshot and the clashing of metal and people running in every uh, direction. And this is Cromwell's great uh, skill. By sunset on Marston Moor, the king's entire northern army had been crushed. Cromwell was fighting a holy war. At the end of battles, he was nearly always elated. Um, he, he writes again and again from the battlefield. Um, he's obviously elated by victory because, of course, victory is also a sign of God's approval. 
God is on his side. So Cromwell knows he's going to win and it's going to be over. And when it's over, he thanks God. God made them a stubble to our swords. We charged their regiments of foot with our horse, routed all we charged. I believe of 20,000, the prince hath not 4,000 left. Give glory, all the glory to God. One of Cromwell's soldiers described the last act of the battle. We chased the enemy to within a mile of York, cutting them down so that their dead bodies lay three miles in length. 4,000 men died that day, and 2,000 more in the weeks that followed from their wounds. Among the dead was Cromwell's own nephew. He wrote to the boy's father. Sir, God hath taken away your eldest son by a cannon shot. It break his leg. We were necessitated to have it cut off. Whereof he died. Sir, the Lord took him into the happiness we all pant after and live for. There is your precious child, full of glory, to know sin nor sorrow any more. You have cause to bless the Lord. At Marston Moor, Parliament found in Oliver Cromwell the military hero it needed. Pamphlets and newspapers quickly latched on to this new man of destiny. An extraordinary outburst of publications, pamphlets, news books, and a new literary style uh, emerges. People are learning now how to reach um, a mass audience. Uh, this is the first age of journalism. It hath pleased God to use Cromwell to win the day and to take the victory out of the enemy's hands. Cromwell is one of the saviors of this Israel. When the Royalist press lampooned him as a big-nosed zealot, parliamentarians retaliated with... It was his bloody sword, not his bloody beak, which made them run. But the war wasn't over. Cromwell was furious with wavering MPs who wanted to make peace with the king. Victory was proof of God's approval, and compromise was not an option. It is now a time to speak or forever hold the tongue. The important occasion now is no less than to save a nation out of bleeding, nay, almost dying condition. If I may speak my conscience without reflection upon any, I do conceive if the army be not put into another method and the war more vigorously prosecuted, the people can bear the war no longer and will enforce you to dishonorable peace. Cromwell was one of the first politicians to understand the guiding principle of modern revolution, that power ultimately lies with the army. He is very effective at using uh, his military success in order to achieve political preeminence. For Cromwell, the military campaign is politics by another means that you know, he sees as very much as he's out there to set the new agenda for England. And in many ways, that's what he does. In the wake of Marston Moor, Cromwell created a new kind of army. 22,000 men recruited and trained like his Ironsides. Within a year, this new model army had smashed the remnants of royalist resistance at the Battle of Naseby. Within another year, they controlled the whole of England. King Charles gave himself up to the Scots, who for 400,000 pounds, handed him into the custody of the English Parliament. The war was over, but as Cromwell was about to discover, the struggle for peace had only just begun. Sixteen forty seven. Cromwell had destroyed the Royalists, yet far from being elated, Cromwell appeared miserable and uncertain. And again, he took to his bed, complaining of an imposthume in the head. You get an impression of a man who's concerned and who's quite depressed and disillusioned, perhaps. The usual explanation given is this point about he's waiting on the Lord. He's waiting to see what God wants him to do. 
His biggest quandary was what to do with the king, now under house arrest at Hampton Court. As one colleague said to Cromwell, If we beat the king 99 times, he is still the king. Eventually, Cromwell and his generals decided they had no alternative but to negotiate with Charles. The army has no desire to introduce a popular party against the king. The king would be able to keep his throne if he gave up his most unpopular reforms. The idea of getting rid of the king had not occurred, if you like, to people at this stage, and they were ultimately going to have to come to terms with this man. So Charles always felt that this was his strongest card, and he's now trying to strengthen his position again and to come back to power. Charles had good reason to be confident. His enemies were deeply divided. The economy was in tatters. Most of the new model army hadn't been paid for over a year. Discontent spread through the ranks. And when soldiers saw their own commanders trying to appease the king, they sensed their cause was being betrayed. And now they demand the birthright for which they fall. 18,000 armed men threatened to march on London. The greatest fear throughout this period is that the army will just unloose its discipline and will sack the great city of London. There'll be chaos, looting, all the things that actually do happen in European cities during the course of the 16th and 17th century. This is on the minds of everyone. Where did Cromwell stand? With his fellow MPs who wanted a return to order or with the soldiers who were the source of Parliament's power? Cromwell is caught in the middle of all of these things and his emotions seesaw uh, from uh, aggressiveness and the fieriness of his spirit on the one hand to this extreme emotionalism uh, and uh, sometimes even depression. There's even an account of him uh, trying to represent the soldiers' concerns in Parliament, breaking down and weeping, saying, these are your loyal soldiers. They have made the greatest of all sacrifices. Something has to be done to take care of them. Cromwell begged Parliament to pay the soldiers, but for the army, the issue was no longer money. They'd fought a war to rid England of an oppressive tyrant. Now they wanted a say in the running of the country. The New Model Army is a unique bunch of individuals for the time. It's hand-picked for piety. It's also unique socially. Virtually all of them come from outside the traditional English ruling class, and they naturally have a rather different perspective on things from those who've bought into the traditional social institutions. So it's almost perfect as a seedbed for evolution at that time. The army stirred up by a coalition of junior officers and radical London intellectuals known as called for freedom of speech and greater democracy. The soldiers' anger could no longer be ignored, so in October 1647, Cromwell and his generals agreed to meet representatives of the soldiers and the levellers in a church in Putney. For the first time, Gentlemen like Cromwell found their natural right to rule was being questioned. The levellers presented a manifesto demanding that all men, not just men of property, be given the right to vote. Truly this paper does contain in it very great alterations to the government of this kingdom. The consequence of this rule tends to anarchy, must lead to anarchy. Sir. For us, the Putney debates is a debate about who is a citizen, who has the right to vote. They represent a struggle between privilege and democracy, between those who are landowners, who are rich and independent, and those who are denizens of the country. In an age of universal uh, suffrage, male and female, uh, we see the Putney debates as a harbinger uh, of our own political system. And not only another, but another, but many of this kind. And if so, what do you think the... During the debates, Cromwell kept his powder dry as Thomas Rainsborough, an army colonel, put forward the leveller demands. The poorest he that is in England hath a life to live, as the greatest he. I find nothing in the law of God that says a lord may choose 20 of the members in Parliament, a gentleman but two, and a poor man none. I find no such thing in the law of nature. If you will plead the law of nature that a man, though he owns no property... The most eloquent critic of the levellers was Cromwell's son-in-law, the lawyer, Henry Ireton. 
By nature, we are free, we are equal. Show me then why I may not, by the same right, take your property. Where does it end? Why should you not take all property? Sir, it is wrong to say, because I am a poor man, I shall be oppressed. I know nothing but this, that they that are the most yielding have the greatest wisdom, and therefore I urge you not to be so hard one with another. He's always trying to keep things calm, to say we mustn't split apart. Yes, yes, you know, surely we can come to some kind of agreement. The most astonishing thing about Putney is that it happened at all. Here was Cromwell, second in command of the army, listening to men like Edward Sexby, a yeoman farmer turned soldier, who before the war would never have dared speak in a gentleman's presence. Now it seems, unless a man hath property in this kingdom, he has no right in this kingdom. I wonder how much we were so deceived. If he had not a right in the kingdom, we were mere mercenary soldiers. I shall declare it again. I, for one, do not seek the destruction of either parliament or king. But I should like to know what the soldier hath fought for all this while. <laughs> I will tell you what the soldier of the kingdom hath fought for. To stop one man's will being law. Everybody here is willing to... Cromwell continued to sit on the fence. And by now, he he'd learned a political peace. trick or two. Perhaps there are many that ought to have a voice who are presently denied it. If we may but create a committee, the question can be progressed further. Truly, sir, you cannot put this question off and come to some other. Nothing else can be settled until this question is. It was the reason that we took up arms. When I see there is an extremity of difference between you, I move for a committee so we can bring the matter to a more general satisfaction. These debates are but, as the Apostle Paul says, dross and dung in comparison of Christ. And I ask why we may so hotly contest these temporal things. Perhaps God may unite us and carry us both one way. He spouts hot air. He talks about arguing the points away by referring them to committees. He calls for prayer meetings in the hope that this will use up time, and also the genuine hope that God will change the minds of the people who he's arguing against. But above all, he wants to remind everybody they're in the same war together. Stop the talking, start once again the old unified crusade against the truly ungodly, the royalists, and those who want to pin down and remove the ability of God's people to worship freely. In spite of Cromwell's efforts, the arguments grew heated and it looked like the generals might lose. Then, on the evening of the 11th of November, the king escaped from house arrest at Hampton Court. The royalist threat was suddenly alive again. The time for debate was over. The king's escape was heaven sent from the point of view of Cromwell because it enabled him to bring the debates to an end, send the agitators back to their regiments. And from that point on, the levellers had really very little chance of taking control of, of the army. Um, and for that reason, again, it was suggested that Cromwell had in some way orchestrated the escape. I don't think the evidence is there to say that, but certainly he must have been very relieved. The king did not get far. He was soon back in the more secure surroundings of Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. But his escape precipitated a crisis that would put Cromwell's leadership to the ultimate test. Two regiments of the army were furious that their demands had been swept aside. In a field near Ware in Hertfordshire, they mutinied. Cromwell had to act. Cromwell hairs down there. He goes straight into the middle of the mutineers. Cromwell pulls the papers they stuck in their hats to indicate their radical sympathies and calls them to order. And by this incredibly dramatic personal intervention, actually brings them to heel. Four ringleaders were arrested. They threw dice so God could choose which one of them would be shot.
Cromwell's message was clear. Discipline counted for more than liberty. It was absolutely necessary to keep things from falling into confusion, which must have ensued upon that division if it had not been timely prevented. The soldiers listen to him, they recognize his authority once more, and the army is tamed. And that's the beauty of Cromwell. He is a man of action, not of words. King Charles observed with glee this division and dissent in the parliamentary army. With his enemies weakened by infighting, he had the perfect opportunity to stage a comeback. Charles was always going behind people's backs. He was the ultimate plotter. He loved wheeling dealing. He was always trying to maneuver around to sort of create political space for himself. And that's exactly what he does. And very successfully in late 1647, from an almost hopeless position, he creates quite an impressive alliance of Scots, Irish Confederates, and royalist opinion in England as well. By early 1648, the Royalist Alliance felt confident enough to strike. While Charles played bowls on the Isle of Wight, his country was once again plunged into war. Cromwell went north to fight the resurgent Royalists and their Scottish allies. But the king's treachery in starting a second civil war had hardened Cromwell's attitude towards him. The Second Civil War transformed his view of Charles. Cromwell saw the First Civil War as a trial of strength, where the two causes were being tried out, and God gave the verdict. So by restarting the war, in Cromwell's eyes, Charles was both responsible for, for the bloodshed and rejecting the will of God. Those traitors that did bring in the Scots in their late invading of this kingdom had committed a more prodigious treason than any that had been perpetrated before. The fault of those who started this second war is certainly double to theirs who were in the first because it is a repetition of the same offence against all the witnesses God has borne by making and abetting a second war. The so-called Second Civil War was short. The well-trained new model army routed the Royalists. But the bloodshed turned Cromwell from a man committed to preserving the monarchy into the man who would destroy it. Cromwell had beaten the king a second time. But Charles had shown he couldn't be trusted. He'd gone against God's will. What should be done with him? Cromwell wrestled with his instincts and once again asked God for guidance. He was not instinctively a political radical. He shared, I think, the outlook of, of his generation and class that the monarchy was a vital part of the social hierarchy. And this, I think, is one reason why we get one of those periods of waiting, one of those periods of uncertainty. But time was not on Cromwell's side. Soldiers who'd watched their comrades die in the recent fighting did not share his doubts. For the first time, there was serious talk of killing the king. For in the army, there is great passion for a trial of Charles Stuart, that man of blood, uh, and for his execution. I think if we want to truly measure the impact of leveler uh, influence on the army, it's on this issue. Uh, it's, the, it's their constant toxin of kill the king, kill the king, that finally infiltrates uh, and forces uh, the leaders of the army to contemplate this action. This was revolutionary talk. And in a revolution, power comes out of the barrel of a gun. When the army realized parliament was steadfastly opposed to killing the king, they took drastic action. On December the 6th, 1648, a troop commanded by a former brewer called Thomas Pride blocked the entrance to Parliament. Only MPs who supported the army were allowed in. This so-called rump Parliament voted to put the king on trial. Cromwell speculated that this military coup might be a message from God. Is this army not a lawful power called by God to oppose and fight the king. 
But truly, these kinds of reasonings are but fleshly, either for or against. Only it is good to test what truth may be in them. And the Lord teaches. After months of agonizing, Cromwell suddenly decided. I think it was difficult for him to make his mind up, but once he's decided, as usual, he's very active, he's, he's very determined, um, he drives it through. And turns himself into one of the most enthusiastic supporters of the trial of Charles I, thereby emerging with the faith and respect of his men as soldiers redoubled and having re-established himself as the leader of the army. The scene was set for the most famous trial in English history. On the 20th of January, 1649, a bitterly cold Saturday, Charles was brought here to Westminster Hall to face 68 judges, hand-picked by the army. Crowds packed the gallery. The chief prosecutor wore a bulletproof hat. Witnesses said the king lost his lifelong stutter and spoke eloquently as he poured scorn upon his judges. I will answer the charges against me as soon as I know by what authority, I mean by what lawful authority, you bring me hither. There are many unlawful... Charles just could not believe what was happening. Being accused of being a traitor uh, just seemed impossible for him. I mean, he was the king. How could he be guilty of, of treason? I mean, this was just beyond his comprehension. He refused to enter a plea. He won't recognize the authority of the court. He always believed that ultimately they were going to have to come back to him and to make a deal. As the trial moved towards its inconceivable climax, some of the judges wavered and called for a last-minute pact with the king. But Cromwell did not flinch. Instead, he was said to have reduced one vacillator to tears. There's no doubt that he was the iron presence uh, in those moments when people did waver. He was the one who persuaded uh, many and brought many along uh, with him, and he was the one who never looked back. Charles, conscious as ever of who he was, maintained that no English court could try a king. Witnesses reported that Charles's demeanor was icy. Only once did the royal mask slip. Charles used his cane to prod uh, one of the court officers, and in doing so, the head fell off, and no one bent down to pick it up. And, of course, Charles didn't know to bend down to pick anything up that he had ever dropped in his whole life. Uh, and it was at that moment, doubtless, that the realization must have sunk in that he was no longer being treated as a king. This court doth the judge that he, the said Charles Stewart. Five days later, the chief prosecutor announced the verdict. To the good people of this nation, and shall be put to death by the severing of his head from his body. Will you hear me a word, sir? Guards, withdraw the prisoner. I may speak after sentence. By your favor, hold. I'm not suffered to speak. I expect what justice other people will have. Charles I was sentenced to death on the 25th of January, 1649. The following day, nine judges disappeared, leaving 59 to sign his death warrant. It was a unique moment in English history, and on Cromwell, it had a peculiar effect. There are comments about Cromwell behaving in a very sort of schoolboy fashion at times, flicking ink. And I think probably it's a sign of tension that no matter how determined he was, I mean, nobody could ever doubt what a momentous act this was. And it's a sign, really, of the, sort of the, the inner tension that people behave in, I suppose you could call it a slightly hysterical way. Less than a week after sentencing, Charles was taken to his former palace at Whitehall to be executed. Just through this window here is modern Whitehall and the street into which Charles stepped onto the scaffold where he faced the silent waiting multitudes, the soldiers glaring at him, hating him, and the executioner's axe. 
He was lucky enough to face a very good executioner. We'll never know exactly who was the guy behind the mask, but almost certainly it was the regular, routine, public beheader, and a good one too. The executioner slashed off his head with one blow, producing the traditional three to four foot splash of blood as all the arteries erupted to form an enormous spreading puddle of gore into which the executioner stepped to hold up the spouting head with its staring eyes by its graying hair and shout out the traditional words, behold the head of a traitor. The diary entries of those who observed are all filled with the absolute horror of the deed. Such a groan went up as never I have heard before and hope never to hear again. And it was literally believed by many, many people that God would exact immediate retribution. The skies would open up. The lightning would rend roofs to the weight of God's uh, wrath. People were, were very shocked, very shocked. And I think even the people who'd done it were probably in a state of shock themselves thinking, well, what do we do next? I mean, this, there's no question, this was a revolutionary act. Oliver Cromwell and his fellow members of the Rump Parliament had swept away nearly a thousand years of monarchy. But would the people accept these men as their new rulers? Look at this new regime. It's profoundly unpopular. It has a very narrow base. It's cut the king's head off. This was not what the war had been fought for. People haven't said in 1642 monarchy should be abolished. How is a broad base of support to be created for it? Well, as often happens in revolution, the answer is you, you go and fight somebody else. And who better than the Irish? Their rulers still swore allegiance to the deposed English royal family. Already a large army had gathered there in support of King Charles's eldest son. What's worse, they were Catholic, responsible in Cromwell's eyes for massacring thousands of God-fearing Protestants. You are part of the Antichrist, whose kingdom the scripture so expressly speaks should be laid in blood, yea, in the blood of saints. You have shed great store of it already. And ere it be long, you must, all of you, have blood to drink, even the dregs of the cup of fury and the wrath of God, which will be poured out unto you. The first town to face Cromwell's wrath was Drogheda, just north of Dublin, which he reached on the 2nd of September with 12,000 men. What he is said to have done here has left a legacy of revulsion that endures to this day. As far as people here are concerned, he came, he saw, he conquered, and he is Satan. He came and he, he was a mass murderer, he took land off people, and he is completely reviled. In fact, he is the epitome of English oppression. To Cromwell, Drogheda was a legitimate target because of the large royalist garrison stationed there. But taking the town was fraught with risk. It was said to be impregnable. You have to appreciate that this is a fortress. It's uh, a wall that's uh, 22 foot high, six feet thick at the base. So they were very confident of the fact that they could actually keep Cromwell at bay. There wasn't a chance that he would get in. The governor of Drogheda was not Irish. He was an English royalist called Arthur Aston. Cromwell gave him the chance to surrender, but he refused, saying, he who could take Drogheda could take hell. On the refusal, Cromwell started the bombardment. These are very strong walls, so it obviously needed something significantly large to make the hole. Um, and this is it, and it's very difficult to actually hold because it's about two stone in weight. It's made of iron, and we know that there were about 500 of these dispatched. After two days of bombardment, the city walls were breached. About half five, September 11, 1649, a manic Cromwell, face bathed in sweat, arrived at this very point. Cromwell's men overran the town. Aston, the governor, and a group of soldiers barricaded themselves in a windmill on a hill called Millmount. 
Arthur Aston shouted down some sort of defiance and they, well, they eventually made an agreement. And the agreement was that the boys up, up above would lay down their arms. And they obviously thought that they were going to live, but uh, pure treachery. Uh, they were all slaughtered where they stood. Aston had refused to surrender. As far as Cromwell was concerned, he'd paid the price. But what Cromwell did next has led some to brand him a war criminal. Even though the rest of the garrison had surrendered, Cromwell ordered his soldiers to kill each and every one of them. I forbade my men to spare any that were in arms in the town. And I think that night they put to the sword about 2,000 men. I am persuaded that this is a righteous judgment of God on these barbarous wretches. It was a pitiless act, but by the standards of the 17th century, hardly an unusual one. If a soldier actually lays down his weapon, whether it's actually morally right to take his life, that's another story. But Cromwell certainly wasn't interested in those sort of niceties at that stage. You know, the rules of war gave him permission to take the lives of every man who was in arms in Drogheda that day, but there were occasions when he used nothing but treachery to do that. The fall of Drogheda shook the whole of Ireland, and with it, the demonization of Cromwell began. The Catholic clergy immediately accused him of slaughtering not just soldiers, but all unarmed men, women, and children in the town. But did Cromwell really murder defenseless civilians? When you go back to the actual contemporary records, to the people who were here at the time, and the people who saw what happened, and see what they have to say, it just doesn't fit. The facts don't substantiate it. There was no systematic slaughter of the civilians of Drogheda, and there was certainly no order given uh, to kill the civilians of Drogheda, but it would seem to me common sense that uh, in the assault that probably some citizens would have been killed as well. Was cold-blooded murder in Cromwell's character? He repeatedly ordered his soldiers to spare those not in arms, he even hanged two of his own men for stealing chickens from the locals. He reacted angrily when accused of killing civilians. Your words are massacre, destroy and banish. Good now. Since my coming into Ireland, give me an instance of one man, not in arms, massacred, destroyed or banished. Compared to other commanders of the day, he was honourable. He managed to exclude civilians from the warfare. And that, at such a time in history, was some achievement. It took Cromwell nine months to crush the royalist resistance in Ireland. Whatever his reputation was there, he returned to England to a hero's welcome. But the euphoria didn't last. Almost before the cheers died away, Cromwell's God began to test him again. If you're fighting battles and always winning them, you know that God is on your side. But in politics, where you have to negotiate, compromise, fudge, deal, God's will is very much harder to discern. In the two years that followed Cromwell's triumphant return, the army and the rump parliament remained bitterly divided. Cromwell had picked his soldiers for their piety, now they demanded freedom to worship as they chose. But MPs feared religious freedom would lead inevitably to anarchy. Cromwell tried desperately to bring the opposing sides together. The reason that we took up arms. One of Cromwell's problems is that he, temperamentally, is that he can be very patient in trying to build up political unity, in trying to bring together people of different views, people who worship in different ways, and say to them, look, you have, what, what you have in common is much more important than what divides you. But then suddenly there are these dramatic, volatile changes. When it became clear Parliament would never allow religious freedom, Cromwell, as always, sided with his soldiers. On the 20th of April, 1653, he led the army into the House of Commons and disbanded Parliament by force. You are no parliament. I say you are no parliament. You are whoremasters and drunkards. I will put an end to your sitting. Call them in. Call them in. 
The rump is dissolved. The army came in. He, he threw away the mace that was the symbol of their power. What, what shall we do with this bauble? Did he have the authority? Not at all. But by this act, he had put himself in a position of unprecedented power. The man who'd fought for Parliament had now summarily dismissed it. As Lord General of the Army, Cromwell, once a Fenland farmer, was now the most powerful man in the land. Oliver Cromwell had to put his newfound power to use. He had to heal a battered, war-torn nation, and for once he knew exactly what to do. Twenty years earlier, when he was in the depths of despair, a Puritan minister had saved him. Experience. Then the Lord will manifest himself to his people. Surely such godly men could do the same for Britain. Cromwell asked parishes up and down the land to select pious, devout men to go to London and form a parliament of saints. This was what Cromwell had fought for, the culmination of all his dreams. He would give up power, and a pious parliament would create an earthly paradise free from grubby politics. His speech at the opening of this parliament revealed him at his most optimistic. I confess, I never looked to see such a day as this, when Jesus Christ should be so owned as he is at this day and in this work. This may be the day to usher in the things that God hath promised, which hath been prophesied of, which he hath set the hearts of his people to wait for and expect. Indeed, I do think something is at the door. We are at the threshold. The Parliament of Saints started well. They passed laws improving the conditions of debtors, prisoners, and lunatics. But the Saints had all too human failings. Radicals demanded tax reform. Landowners saw their incomes threatened. Parliament was once again divided. This creates not a paralysed body as the rump parliament had been. It creates a body so at war with itself that it actually collapses, breaks down, tears itself apart after about six months. For Cromwell, the collapse of the Parliament of Saints was a bitter disappointment. He wrote in desperation, Truly, I never more needed all helps from Christian friends than now. Without either king or parliament, how would England be governed? Once again, Cromwell turned to God. And once again, God spoke through the army. Its leaders came to Cromwell with a proposal unique in English history. On the 16th of December, 1653, in a hastily improvised ceremony at Westminster Hall, Oliver Cromwell was declared Lord Protector of Britain and Ireland, the only commoner ever to become head of state. Cromwell insisted this was not base ambition, but divine necessity. I called not myself to this place, of that God is my witness. But it is sinful to be quit of that power God has most providentially put in my hands. I don't think for one moment he envisaged finding himself as the Lord Protector. But I think Cromwell was always ambitious in the sense that he wanted to influence. He wanted to perhaps to control. He wanted to help shape things. He wanted to have the power to do things. Getting things done meant manipulating people, which Cromwell did with a certain charm. They do give the impression that at the time they'd been rather magnetized by Cromwell's presence, that he talked to them with candor and openness, and then they'd gone away afterwards and wondered, actually, how much had he really told them? He's always trying to see who he can use, who's on his side, who wants what, because he's got in this very unusual, unorthodox political situation to try to build a new political establishment. 
Being protector had its perks. Accommodation at Hampton Court and Whitehall Palace, with a handsome budget for tapestries, musicians, and even a painting or two. But Cromwell had no time for pretension. He told a portrait painter, I desire you would use all your skill to paint your picture truly like me, and not flatter me at all. But remark all these roughness, pimples, warts, and everything as you see me, otherwise I will never pay a farthing for it. His wife was said to be frugal with the palace kitchen budget, serving him plain country food like black pudding and fried eggs. Cromwell was never comfortable with the stateliness that was now expected of him. The man himself is extremely informal. He's quite a party animal. He likes dancing, he likes drinking, he loves uh, tobacco, and he loves really childish practical jokes, like dabbing food into people's chairs before they sit down. I mean, it's, it's hardly witty stuff. On the other hand, an apparent spirit of routine duty, he submits to rituals which are incredibly king-like. I think he knew that you had to do that. And living in Hampton Court, you know, it, it, that's important. And receiving foreign ambassadors, you know, England's got to look uh, impressive on the continent. And increasingly, Cromwell's England, with its newfound stability and highly trained army, did seem impressive to its neighbors. England in the 17th century, when it's under the Stuart kings, is a weak power. It becomes easily a satellite of other foreign powers. Um, it can't really compete. And yet under Cromwell, uh, this army and navy caused the great monarchies of France and Spain to tremble. At home, Cromwell sought to lead his people into a promised land of reformed morals. His generals clamped down on whoring, gambling and drinking, earning Cromwell his reputation as a repressive killjoy. I think in fairness, it has to be said that the moral standards of many sections of the population would not be acceptable to most people today. I mean, when we talk about, you know, maple dancing, we're not talking about innocent maidens dancing round the village green in Merry England. There was drunkenness, adultery, wife beating. These were all things that went on. And there was a, an attempt to, Im to improve these standards. But godly reform was not as popular as Cromwell had hoped. Had the reforming Puritans had their way, then England in the 1650s would have been an unbelievably grim place in which the main recreation is going to church and the second best is talking about it afterwards very earnestly. But in fact, uh, the difference in English life is uh, very moderate indeed. Ale houses are closed down in large numbers and open up in equally large numbers a short while afterwards. And rather like uh, raves in the 1980s, early 1990s, the Puritan police keep hearing about uh, Maypole dancing and village revels and ales, and always turn up too late to find them. Realising his people had little appetite for moral improvement, Cromwell quickly distanced himself from his zealous foot soldiers. But his biggest disappointment was the conduct of his fellow Puritans. Twenty years earlier, they'd gone to war because the king had persecuted them for their religious views. Now they had become the persecutors. The most famous case was that of a young Quaker called James Naylor. Naylor rode a donkey into Bristol, reenacting Christ's entry into Jerusalem. Naylor was merely exercising his right to worship in his own way. But the Puritans called it blasphemy, and they punished him by boring a hole in his tongue, branding him on the cheek, and jailing him for life. To Cromwell, such intolerance was a betrayal of the cause he'd fought for. Is it ingenuous to ask for liberty and not to give it? What greater hypocrisy than for those who were oppressed to become the greatest oppressors themselves so soon as their yoke was removed? I had rather that Mahometanism be permitted amongst us than that one of God's children should be persecuted. After five years of rule, England was far from the devout, joyful country of Cromwell's dreams. 
He ages quite rapidly under the protectorate. Uh, there's a tremendous sense of strain, I think, and of loneliness. Um, one of the things about power, uh, supreme power, is it can be quite lonely because you don't know, it's very hard to know what the people around you think because they're going to tell you what they think you want uh, to hear. Behind his back, the satirists sneered. A protector? What's that? Tis a stately thing that confesseth itself but the ape of a king. Perhaps a king was what the country really wanted. Perhaps this was the only way to heal the wounds of the civil war. A powerful group of MPs became convinced of this. On the 31st of March, 1657, just eight years after Charles I's execution, Parliament offered Cromwell the crown. If you simply took the title of king, you would have a great chance to stabilise the new regime, to give it a much wider base of support in the country. And Cromwell sees the political logic of that. But true to form, Cromwell couldn't make up his mind. Two and a half months later, he still hasn't answered. Now, during that particular time, he smokes heavily. He retires, he listens to deputations of people representing every viewpoint, he takes advice all over the place, and he gets sick. The strain is too much for him, his health collapses, as usual, when he's in a fix. At seven o'clock in the evening, he'll decide, yes, I am. At 12 o'clock that night, he'll decide, no, I'm not. He learns that the army surrounding London is preparing to send a demand to Parliament that it drop the uh, offer of the Crown. He meets three of the army leaders in St James's Park and they unreservedly say that they will resign if he becomes king because that's not what they fought for. Cromwell knew only too well that he owed everything to the army. And so when the chips were down, he once more sided with his soldiers. After months of dithering, he finally told Parliament of his decision. I cannot undertake this government with the title of king. I think he's simply not convinced that what God wants is for him to take the crown. And if he got it wrong, I mean, if he made himself king against God's will, it would be an awful mistake. Truly, the providence of God has laid this title aside prudentially. God hath not only dealt so with the persons and the family, but he hath blasted the title. There would be no King Oliver. Cromwell was now 58 years old and his health was declining. Within a year, his mother and favorite daughter were dead. He had refused the crown. The government of England was in disarray. Above all, Cromwell realized his dream of a godly Britain would never come to pass. These all turn Cromwell inward, and again he believes that he is being tested by God, uh, that he is being challenged. It's a test from which he's not sure he can emerge successfully. I think that the last uh, summer of Cromwell's life is unrelieved tragedy. He's failed absolutely. He's kept his uh, place as Lord Protector, but the country is politically paralyzed. He can't work with the Parliament. The army is restless and unhappy with him. Nobody around him has any idea of where to go out of this uh, complete deadlock. And he's exhausted. No man, no man but a man mistaken, and greatly mistaken, could think that I, that hath a burden upon my back for the space of 15 or 16 years would seek such a place as I bear. I would rather, as to my own conscience and spirit, to have been living under a woodside, to have kept a flock of sheep, rather than to have undertaken such a place as this was. On the 3rd of September, 1658, Oliver Cromwell died at home in his bed. He was 59. A death mask was made, but efforts to embalm his body went horribly wrong. It was hastily buried in Westminster Abbey. Six days later, a wood and wax effigy was laid out in Whitehall. The thousands who turned out for Britain's biggest ever state funeral were none the wiser. Within two years of Cromwell's death, the monarchy was restored. The new king, Charles II, ordered Cromwell's body to be strung up like a traitor. 
It was an ignominious end for a man who'd wanted to create God's kingdom on Earth. Perhaps a more fitting epitaph is his last ever speech to Parliament, summing up the cause for which he'd fought all these years. Liberty of conscience must be secured for honest people, that they may serve God without fear, that all men be preserved in their just rights, whether civil or spiritual. I never looked to see such a day as this. Cromwell does achieve greatness, the greatness he certainly never wanted. He is not a Democrat. He certainly doesn't believe in egalitarianism. But the things that he did all nudge us forward towards those goals. It is a very slow process of democratization in Britain. It could not have taken place without the contribution that Cromwell made. For more on Oliver Cromwell, go to channel4.com slash history. And the English Civil War season concludes on Thursday with Charles I's assassinators in the dock. Trial of the King Killers. Details coming up. And there's life next, but not as we know it. David Duchovny and Julianne Moore star in the sci-fi film comedy Evolution. Gentlemen of the jury, we bring before you into judgment this day the murderers of a king. When the revolution was over, someone had to pay. That blood cries out to you for vengeance and will not be appeased but by a bloody sacrifice. The men who killed England's king had a last chance to argue for their lives. Guilty as charged. You see a dead man living. May God have mercy upon your soul. Taken from transcripts and first-hand testimony, the English Civil War season concludes with the trial of the Kingkillers, Thursday at 9 on 4.